Uh, I'll just start off real quick. Uh, this is a tech talk, and it's just going to be camp for today. He's going to be recording, um, and he has a really cool presentation for us today. Uh, you may have seen parts of this if you went to the broader engineering org tech talk uh, about two weeks ago, I think, two, three weeks ago. But we're getting the director's cut edition. Um, so we're going to be seeing even cooler stuff. So uh, with no further ado, please, Campus, uh, take us on this wonderful journey. Okay, so as a... As was indicated, you know, today I'm going to give you guys a talk about a project that I've been doing on my own, which is basically to build a custom CPU out of TTL logic using the Von Neumann architecture and a lot of blinking lights because you don't do this stuff uh, if you uh, don't want the blinking lights. Uh, sorry, oh, there we go. Okay, and so let's, uh, let's get right into it. So the first question is, why would I do this? Like, well, why would I spend time to make a, a, a very a computer out of uh, basic logic chips is basically what I'm doing. Well, you know, we all work with uh, social video here at our company. And um, one of the key things is I came across a series from a guy named uh, Ben Eater that where he built a very basic computer uh, that actually has a name. It's called SAP-1, which means simple as possible, dash one. Uh, and he built it out of logic chips on a breadboard. And I watched that series and I found it fascinating. I found it interesting. I've always been involved with uh, computers in some capacity in my career. Um, and so, you know, understanding how they work at the very low level, I, I just, it was interesting to me. Then the pandemic happened, right? And, um, well, we found, we, as you guys all know, uh, found, ended up having a lot of time at home and uh, needed something to do other than other than uh, other than work and uh, uh, watching TV. So, you know, I, th I thought I'm going to build this computer, and so I did, and, and and I and I learned it was it's actually a very good series. If you're not any way interested in how computers work at a very low level, and you don't want to read a very dense theoretical book. This series by Ben Eater, it's really great. You, you really do come away with understanding the, the basics of everything. So I went ahead and built it. And here it is. Like here is the, the computer that I ended up building based on that design. I had some small modifications compared to what you would see in the video, but fundamentally it's the same thing, right? I completed it in December, 2020, a few months after the, the pandemic started. Um, and the specs are, and these are interesting, 16 bytes of RAM. In fact, this RAM is for, both for program and data. So I have 16 bytes to work with. Uh, I had a 40 Hertz clock. You know, so 40 instructions or cycles per second. Uh, I had 11 instructions and I had a lot of blinking lights. You, you see them all over there. The instructions that, that I had are listed here. And, and this is, of course, if any of you have done any assembly, you kind of recognize the concepts here. If you haven't, um, these, these are the only instructions that you could work with at the, at the low level. Uh, the first one being a no operation because every instruction set needs an OOP because why not? Uh, the first one, LDA. Uh, what that means is load into register A the data at a particular memory address. So it would take one operand, uh, specifically the address where the memory of the memory that you want to load. And so it grabs that memory and then puts it into the register A. Uh, add is it adds the value at a particular address to whatever is in register A. Sub to subtract a value at a particular address where register A. Store STA. Um, is take the value that's in register A and store it at an address in, in RAM. And so from the, those four instructions there, you now can uh, do a lot of things. You know, the, 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 these are the basic instructions. If you've ever learned about a Turing machine, these are the basic instructions. I don't have everything to be Turing complete yet based on those four instructions, but basically you're, you're reading data, you're operating on the data, and then you're putting it back down uh, to the tape, so to speak, where the RAM here is the tape. Uh, just a few other instructions. Uh, LDI, that's just load immediate, where the rather than loading a value from a, a space of memory, you actually store the value in the instruction itself, so to speak, and then it gets loaded directly into A. Um, then finally, the instructions that you need in order to make it, it Turing complete, which are jumps and conditional jumps. Uh, the first one is just a jump saying take instruction directly to a particular uh, address where the, there is an instruction to operate on. Uh, the next one, JC, is jump based on the carry bit. So in the add and subtract operation, there are various flags that get set in the 
in the uh, computer that uh, indicate the outcome of the operation. So if you're adding two numbers together, it's an 8-bit adder, by the way, uh, and the, the result of the addition uh, cannot be represented in 8 bits. In fact, it overflows to the ninth bit. Well, technically, overflow is not the right term. It carries to the ninth bit. Um, then the, that the carry flag gets set. And so that's something that you can then base the jump off of. If I just did something in the, in the addition operation, which set the carry flag, I can jump based on that. If the carry flag's not set, it won't jump, you know? And then having that conditional kind of uh, jump there uh, allows you then to have a Turing complete computer and, and able to do everything that a Turing computer could do. Maybe not as efficiently as other computers, but at a very basic level, we can do everything. Had one more conditional jump, which is JZ, which is jump of zero. So if the operation that you just did, the add or subtract operation that you just did result in a value that was equal to zero, it would set a zero flag and you can jump based off of that too. That was actually very handy to determine if a value is equal to something. So if I wanted to determine if a value was equal to five, for example, I would just subtract five from it. And if the result is zero, then you know there it was equal to five. Right. And then I can jump based on it. If the result was anything else, it wasn't equal to five. And so I wouldn't jump. So that, that would ended up being the jump that I ended up using most when I programmed at this level. The next two instructions are more uh, interface instructions. The out takes a value and places it into what's called the display register. If you go back to this picture here, you see this little display over to the, the right here of a, a seven segment LEDs. Uh, that that will show in decimal the, the value in the display register. So you, you basically have a very basic output here to kind of see what are the results of something. Uh, and then the halt just stops the program altogether. Technically, it stops the clock, which has the effect of stopping the program. So based on that, you can do some stuff, right? You know, 16 bytes of RAM, not much, but you can do some stuff. Um, to get to give you an exa example or a kind of intuition of how this works at a very low level, here's an architecture. Here's like an architecture diagram of the computer or the various parts, you know, the various registers, what's connected to what, the, the, the data bus that goes down the middle, the data bus connects everything to each other. So this is where all the data gets transferred from parts to parts. Um, and, and so on. And so what I want to kind of show real quick is just to give you a basic idea how one of the instructions actually works at the low level. And we're going to go over LDA, which is loading a value that is at a particular memory address into the register A, which is right here. And the reason why you may want to load it in the register A, because the next operation is you may want to add or subtract a number from it um, using the arithmetic logic unit. But let's just go through that. So the first step you have to do is the program counter. What the program counter does is it keeps track where in your program's execution you are. And what the program counter actually contains is a memory address. And all it does is increments that memory address. Um, and then if you want to jump, uh, what a jump instruction does is actually change the program counter's value to an explicit value, right? And, and so what we're doing here is we're taking the value that's in current currently in the program counter and moving it into the memory address register. And once it's in the memory address register, then you can take the, it, what it does is it tells RAM to write the value at that address to the data bus. And what we're going to do is move that value to the instruction register, because what that is technically is the instruction we're going to operate. What the instruction register does is based on the instruction value, which is the machine code uh, that is in it, it will configure the computer to do the next steps, right? It will, it will, it will set some control lines to say, you know, to, to activate the reg A register or the memory address or whatever is needed, right? And once the instruction is in there, we can move on to the next step. And what, uh, what we're doing is the instruction register actually has the, uh, when we do a, in this architecture, when you do a load from memory address, the memory address that you're trying to uh, load from is actually embedded in the instruction itself. It, it, it's a detail that would take a little long to explain here. So I'm going to gloss over that, but the address is embedded in the instruction itself. And so what ends up happening is the next step is to take that address from the instruction register, place it back into memory address register, which you were just at, in order to get the value that you want to move it to A. And so the last step is now that the memory address register has been updated with the address of the value that you want to get, you just tell the RAM to write that to the data bus and register A to read it from the data bus. And that loads it into the register A. Those are all the steps that this one instruction has to go through to accomplish that. 
Um, <clears throat> are we constantly overriding the values in the eight bit data bus? Yeah, like, oh yeah, yeah. The, the, the data bus is a is a transient thing. It's a it, it doesn't maintain a value. Something has to be actively writing to it, and something that has to be actively reading from it for a transfer to occur. You can think of the bus more as a, a bunch of wires that just connects to everything, but it doesn't okay. store anything. What stores stuff are the things that are hanging off of the data bus, the registers more specifically. That's what a register does is store a value. Got it. Okay, thanks. Okay, cool. All right, and and that's that's the instruction here. Um, here's an example program written in the mnemonics of the those instructions, and all it does is multiply two numbers together. Now you have to you have to put those numbers into RAM yourself. If you go back to the uh, gotta go through all that. If you go back to this uh, picture of the SAP one, you'll notice right about here there are some uh, switches here in here. Um, this is how you actually enter the values. If you ever saw computers, pictures of computers from the 1970s, they usually had a bunch of switches in front that allowed people to manually code in values to specific memory addresses. And so you would, you'd set the memory address. I would set the memory address with this switch here and then set the value of this switch here. And that's how you would code it in. And so when we get back to this code, you'll notice that I have, uh, some byte values. That is where the, uh, the value is actually going to be stored, but I have to manually using those switches actually put that value in place in order to do the multiplication. Kind of you know old school, but that was the point. This is a very simple computer. And then the rest of this code does, does that. And it's a very simple addition. That's all we're doing for this multiplication here is you take one value to, to be the loop counter um, and the other value to be the thing that you keep on repeatedly adding. And then you add them up that many times and you get your result. And then you write your result into the output register and so to display on those seven segment LEDs. Pretty simple. And, oh, by the way, this took 16 bytes of RAM. You know, between all these instructions and, and the things that I had to store, it took 16 bytes of RAM. And so you couldn't do much more of this to that computer. So I was unsatisfied. Right. I, I, I wanted to do more than just a very simple multiplication loop. And in some ways, at this point, being able to do that, I was finished with the Ben Eater video series. And so I kind of want to prove to myself, well, did I learn something? Can I do something more? And so I, I went to add more to it. Now, most of you know, I like the factorial problem. It's a great problem to demonstrate your understanding of various aspects in computer science. It, it's something you can build on. It, it's, it's, a, it's deceptively simple, right? You know, it looks like a simple algorithm, but there's so much you can do with it. Uh, and so I decided to use that as a problem to try to see if I could get my uh, computer to actually do the factorial. I figure I use it enough in interviews. I'm going to interview myself, so to speak. And so I, first thing I figured out was using the instruction set that what came with the SAP one, I would need 26 bytes to actually calculate the factorial. What that would do would be implementing a, a loop of the addition loops, you know, so the addition loop is to do the multiplication and then you have to do a loop around that to do the recursion that the algorithm actually implies here. Right. And uh, so the computer as built could not do that. And so I had a question, what can I do? You know, what the obvious solution is add more RAM, right? Add more RAM that the, the computer could work off of. Uh, however, I wanted to go a different path. I wanted to do a, 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 a kind of a more challenging, maybe not challenging, but more enabling way uh, to add more registers to the computer that do a very specific thing called incrementable registers. And the thing with, if you do a the factorial using an addition loop for multiplication, basically you have two nested loops. And if I could have a register manage those loops, because that was the big thing that was taking up a bunch of the of the, ran, of the instruction space in the 26 byte version that I just described, if I could have registers manage the, the incrementing and determining when the loop is to where you want it to be, um, it would work better. And so I did. I, I worked on that. I designed, here's the electrical design for the, the increment registers that I put together that uses a, rather than just a simple flip-flop for storing a value, it, it's actually able to directly increment and decrement. So I didn't have to uh, move the value into the ALU in order to increment or decrement it. It can happen in place. Um, and I built the computer to actually do that. And that's what the computer looked like. It was the same thing as the SAP one, but now it has these uh, additional 
uh, bits down here, which is the new increment registers. I also had to, I also had to change the control logic because I needed more control lines, but that that's a that's a big uh, detail that I'm going to gloss over here. But uh, and I was able to do it in 16 bytes. I didn't I didn't add more RAM, but to adding the those increment registers, which basically handled the loops for me. I didn't need instructions to, you know, move the value, the loop counter into the register A, add a one to it, determine if it's a certain value and all that. That happened in hardware. And thus I was able to do the factorial uh, within 16 bytes on this computer. But I was still unsatisfied because it's still a, it's an 8-bit computer, but it had a maximum ability to show 8-bit results because the display register itself was 8 bits. And it was hard to kind of do a higher order type type of uh, operations in order to calculate bigger numbers of more precision. So I wanted it to do more. And specifically, I wanted to do calculate a 64-bit factorial. So, you know, I felt that would be the, the, the proof that I learned something. If I can uh, build the breadboard computer or update the breadboard computer to be able to calculate a factorial, a 64-bit factorial. But as I thought through what would I need to do that, I realized there was a lot of changes I needed to make. For one, I needed more memory space. For real this time, I needed more memory because 64 bits, that's eight bytes. That's half the memory space that uh, uh, the computer currently had. And that was just to store a value. And of course, I would need more than that just to, to calculate things. So I needed to add more memory space. I also needed the ability to do 64-bit multiplication. And the challenge there has to do with, uh, you know, how I was doing multiplication up to this point, which is just simply doing an addition loop. But if I was starting to do higher order numbers, higher precision numbers, um, you know, like large values, if I want to multiply a million times a million, uh, doing a addition loop for over a million times a million means you have to loop a million times, which would take forever, right? So I had to do that much more quickly than that and figure out how to, in hardware, uh, do those multiplications more quickly. Also realized since I was going to be writing more complex code, one of the the, the, the nice things to have is a, is a stack, a stack pointer. And, and when once you have a stack pointer, you can do function calls because what you store on the stack is your return address uh, from where you call it, right? And so that's a hardware element. And so I had to build a stack pointer. And, if, and probably the most important, well, maybe not the most important, but you know, it's critical uh, addition was a means by which to display a 64-bit number. So a 64-bit number in decimal takes at most 20 digits, right? And so I needed something that could show 20 digits if I if were going to calculate a value that large. Uh, the, the display register that I had had at most three digits. So I had to figure that out and had to solve that. So we'll get into what I did there. There's also some other desirable changes. As I thought about it, I didn't think they were strictly necessary to accomplish my goal, but in making a general purpose uh, computer, it was uh, uh, I thought it was valuable and would make things easier. Easier One is an offsetable address register. Uh, if you've ever done assembly uh, programming, uh, these are what people frequently refer to as index registers, where you can give it an address and then a value, and then it will go to a memory location that is uh, that some of those two together, but you don't have to do that someday yourself in code. Uh, and so I thought that would be convenient. It's what it, where it ends up being really convenient uh, is if I'm trying to convert a value into a hex, like a string, for, so to speak. So the address that I would put in the register is the address of a lookup table and the offset is the value itself. And so if I'm trying to convert a value into a hex value, right? I just have a lookup table of from zero, one, two, three, that has all the characters all the way up to F. And then the value just tells me exactly which character that I need to add to my string, right? So that's what you would use an offsetable register for. There are other uses, but that's kind of the, the easiest to explain. Logic instructions, you know, I want to be able to and and or and exclusive or values, that, that would be important. Then also value comparison. Um, I mentioned earlier a way to do value comparison is through subtraction, and that that is totally workable, and you can get what you want done. But it'd be nicer if the hardware could just do it directly, and I didn't have to go through these implicit or implied kind of interpretations of what just happened. 
uh, and be able to compare values directly in hardware. So I wanted to add that. And one of the very critical one was to actually do what's called bit testing, being able to say, what is the value of bit six of this particular value? And where that's important is when you start having peripherals or adding components to your computer where there's some kind of status register or some sort, frequently individual bits in that register mean something, and you just want to test an individual bit. So I felt that was important to add to. So I set out to do that. And this is what I ended up designing. This is what the, the, the architecture on the right-hand side of what the computer looks like. Uh, some of the things you'll see, you know, that you still have the A register and the uh, temp register and ALU, but there's a bunch of other things in here. I still have the I and J register. Um, I also have a comparison unit. Uh, the display now is an LCD display. Specifically, it is 20 characters wide by four rolls. And so it can display a 64-bit number because it has enough space to show the 20 characters or 20 digits. So that was good. Um, it still has the instruction register because every computer has it. I have this HL register is that uh, offsetable register that I talked about. You'll notice I have a new bus called an, uh, the address bus. This is because I want, if you want more memory, your address space has to be larger. And so I'm using 16 bits for my address space, which means basically I have 64K of total address space to work with. Uh, and so that's why that exists here. But in order to have an offsetable uh, register, I actually have to add another adder here, which you know the ultimate address that the RAM actually interacts with is the sum of whatever is put on the address bus by these registers, plus whatever I put in the offset register. And that's where that RAM actually acts on. The specs here are, I have 32, uh, of the 64K of address space I have, I put 32K to RAM, RAM that is, uh, 30K to ROM, 2K to memory map IO. What memory map IO is, is you can, you just, in hardware, you kind of configure things that uh, this particular peripheral, rather than being a different instruction, it's just a memory address. So for me to write a value to the LCD screen, for example, I just write a value to a particular memory address and it shows up on an LCD screen. And, and that, so that's what memory map IO does for you, is it just makes your if you, you, you do set things up a certain way in hardware, it makes programming it all a little bit easier. I have my ALU can do a bunch of different things from addition, subtraction, all the logic. It can do right shifts and left shifts. And this is, ends up being critical for doing multiplication. As you know, um, left, shifting left is the same as just multiplying by two. And you do enough of those in the right order, you can multiply any number by any number. And, and, and so having that done in hardware just makes things much more fast than, than doing a, an addition loop. You can do comparisons and bed testings. I have the four by 20 register uh, display. Um, various registers in order to do programming. These are like local variables. You can, you can think of them that way. And in my instruction space, it's actually a nine bit instruction space, which gives me 511 different instructions. Now, the thing I want to emphasize about that, it doesn't mean I have 511 different like mnemonics that like I showed you earlier, but if I want to like move memory, if I want to move a value from the I register to the A register, that's in my, in the, uh, language that I set up, it, the, the mnemonic is MOV space A comma I, right? It's coming from the A register, I register and going to the A register. Now, if I want to move something from, from A to I, it would be MOV space um, I comma A. From a computer's perspective, those are two different instructions. Even though in the mnemonics that I set up, they look the same, they just have different operands. The, the, the instruction for machine code is based on the combination of, of the uh, the mnemonic and the operands that are that are operating on it. So any unique combination of operands would produce another instruction. So I have 511 um, different possible combinations of mnemonics and operands put together in order to get what I wanted to do. It turns out with all the things that I could do um, with you know all these registers and the, and the various things I could move to, I would need more than 511 instructions to, to embody everything that you could do. So one of the design choices I had to make was what instructions am I going to support? And so, you know, it, it, this, this by no means is all of them, but kind of give you a sense of way I was thinking about it of, you know, what instructions I still want uh, here. For example, I have a, 
sorry, I have this pop instruction and I have this little X and that means the operand, but then I have to think about what operands can I support? It's an 8-bit destination. And what is the machine code for when I have that? It, it, you know, the prefix is of these zeros and ones and then the XXX represents the destination that I have. And so that implies there that I can have up to seven different 8-bit destinations in my computer um, program. And so that's the kind of the design process I had to think through. What were the important instructions? What kind of operands I needed to support? Map that out. And, I, and basically, that's how I come up with an instruction set. When you hear about x86 and ARM64, that's exactly what they're talking about, is what are the, all the combinations of uh, operations and operands together will this uh, CPU support in order to get work done? Uh, and that's what an instruction set architecture is, is that design. Make sense so far? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> did you have any like issues with Endian, like choosing which direction your bits are laid out in memory or? So no issues, but you do have to make a choice. And I chose a little Endian. And, and the reason why I chose a little Endian is when you're doing multi-byte additions. So if you go back to here, uh, you'll notice my data bus is still eight bits. And so for me to add a 64 byte number or 64 bit number to a 64 bit number, obviously I'm going to work through eight bytes, right? Do you're going to do eight addition operations to get the through. And the order you want to do is you want to start with the least significant byte first and then work your way up to the most significant byte. Because when you do the, the ad, adding the two least significant bytes, if there's a carry, you want to carry that carry over into the next byte set of bytes that you're going to add together in order to get the correct result, right? Uh, if you're if your numbers are, are in little Indian order in your memory, it's just easier to kind of work through that because all you're doing is incrementing your addresses uh, as you work through, work through the various bytes in order to get your final result. If they were in big Indian, that ends up being a little harder because you have to rather increment addresses, you have to decrement them. You have to, you know, you, you say your value is at address one, you know, hex 1000, right? But then you have to add eight to that to get the least significant byte because that's what you have to add first. And then you start decrementing from there in order to get the next bytes. It's just easier to reverse the order into little Indian to kind of get that done, which is why you find that most 8-bit computers from the 70s and 80s were little Indian. But as the computer's bit space, like their ALL can, ALU can handle larger values, you started, you started seeing them being big Indian because then it becomes easier when you're doing 32 bits at a time and you're doing on a 32-bit number. Why would you put it in little Indian? Make sense? Yeah, thanks, man. Yeah. So cool. Uh, so moving on. Um, and so here it is. Here is the computer uh, as built today. Um, I want to give you a quick tour of that and then we'll talk about a few other things and we'll get into the demo of it um so the the, the tour of it is what are the various parts that you're seeing what i have highlighted here is where the alu is now more specifically what you're looking at is the a register plus the alu plus the comparison unit plus the, the temperature everything together that allows me to do the math and, and what i want to comparisons that I want to do. Uh, if you're looking in more detail, this top line of chips up here, that's the A register. The next line is actually the logic unit that does the additions and the ands and the exclusive ors. Uh, the next line is the temp register. And below that, this is all the comparison unit that does the comparing of values and, and such. Uh, the next thing is the program counter. That is the combination of all these chips here. Um, that, that may seem like a lot, it kind of is, but what's going on here is everywhere you see yellow wires, those are control lines. Everywhere you see blue wires, that's a data line. And everywhere you see a gray wire, that is a uh, that is an address bus, the upper address bus actually. And green wires are like internal to a component, just lines that connect between them. And so the program counter had to connect to a lot of things and need a lot of control lines and needed, a, uh, actually needed a, a arbiter here. It's actually a multiplexer because I could input, uh, I could set my program counter based on input from the address bus or from the ad, address bus over here or the data bus. And so I needed some chips here to kind of multiplex and, and decide which one is actually gonna set the program counter. So it looks, it's more complicated it's a simple in concept, but it, it took up more chips than most other registers to get done. 
Here's the memory address register. Now this is simple. It just contains the 16-bit value. And when instructed, we'll assert that value to the address bus for usage. Um, what else we got? The stack pointer, similar concept, but it keeps track of a, of a value that we call the stack. HL register, this is the, inc the offsetable 16-bit register. The RAM and ROM right there, I'm actually using a 32K byte uh, a ROM right there. And right here is actually a 64K RAM. So this had more memory than I needed. And so I just wired a certain of those address lines to my address lines and then kind of grounded the rest to just use half of it. What I since realized when I was putting together the stack register is that my stack could actually use the extra 32K of RAM. And so what you probably saw on my last uh, slide is that I actually have 32K of dedicated stack, which is far more than I could ever use. Uh, in my, the various programs I've written so far, I don't think I've gotten deeper into my stack than 100 bytes. But nonetheless, it's there. If I, if I wanted to push 32K on the, the stack, it's there. Uh, my memory map controller, this is what does the uh, memory map uh, IO kind of controls that I talked about earlier. The, this is the INJ register, the same INJ register that I built originally to do the first version of the factorial, uh, simplified in this case uh, for various reasons, which I, I will gloss over here. The instruction register, you'll notice I have a bunch of LEDs here which help me understand the instruction. The instruction itself uh, itself is an 8-byte or 8-bit value, but due to the way other things are contributing from the flag registers to the step counter and such, uh, they, you end up having a 16-bit value going to the control logic. And so these colors to actually tell me what are the values of the various zones from the step counter to the instruction to uh, the uh, extended bit is what I call it to the various flag registers and help me understand what's going on. And then finally, control logic. The control logic is where the microcode is that actually that manipulates what I showed earlier for like for the LDA instruction. That's where that's all coded is in these EPROMs right here. That and what the EPROMs do is just basically activate certain lines based on the combination of instruction, step count, and flags. And programming those right is what uh, actually affects the the computer logic that you're trying to do. One more thing that I don't think I actually highlighted here down the lower left, that's my display. So I wrote the 64-bit factorial software. You know, and once I had the hardware, I had to write the software. Uh, just quick, can you go back on that page? Yeah, sure. What, what are all those black chips? Like, what are those things? What do they do? So there are various kinds of chips. I mean, the, the, most of them... There's a lot of them that are what we refer to as logic chips. All they do is do the, like the AND operation or the OR operation or, or what have you. Um, and so the wires going into it, you know, if both of them are high, the out, if it's an AND operation, if both of them are high, the output will be high, and, and, which is exactly what you want. Some of them are more um, higher level chips. You know, if, if you ever did the, the NAND game, which you can find online, one of the things you realize in that game is everything can be built from a NAND gate, which is that you know it's, it's high when both the inputs are low type, type of thing. Um, and so basically everything's kind of built off of that, but some of these higher order chips, like uh, the registers themselves, uh, they are what we refer to as flip-flops. Uh, and, and based on uh, the input in, in a clock value, you know, when the clock goes high, it will, read, it will save whatever the input value is, is into their internal state. And then you can read that from it later, at a later date, regardless of what happens to the input value. You can read the current state. And that's essentially what a register is. And you can build those out of logic chips if you want to, but you can also buy a chip that actually has it built in at the very low level, all the logic needed to create that flip flop. And then there's like the ALU, you know, the, the doing addition, the addition operation is a, bu it's a bunch of logic gates for sure, but you can compress it down to one chip so that you don't have to think about what all those individual logic gates are doing. You just know you have a few wires coming in from one source and the other source, and it will output the sum of the two, so to speak. Um, and I can go on, there's a lot of different chips, but, uh, they, they are doing very specific logic operations that I needed to do in order to affect the behavior I want. Uh, actually, I have a question about uh -huh. like debugging a 
testing maybe like once you finish the hardware and like you, you're gonna start writing like more complicated programs than like just the i, I guess basic commands uh basic operations like how do you make sure everything is connected working do you test these components individually do, do you test every command or like how how does that so work out? yes yes i did um and there's two kinds of testing. There's hardware testing to make sure the hardware is doing what you think thought it was supposed to do. And frequently I realized my hardware design was wrong, that it didn't do what I thought it would do. And I would have to change that or there was something else up. And then of course there's the classic software testing. I'll mention the software testing because we're, we're all more familiar with that here. Clearly I don't have a debugger for this. Like there's no like st stepping debugger that I can use. I do have, if you look very closely here, there is this blue button um, on the left middle side. I can, I can put the clock into single step mode where I'm manually clocking it rather than, uh, rather than it happening at, you know, hundred kilohertz or whatever it's happening, which is too fast for me to watch. And then as I manually clock it with all these LEDs, I can see what's going on you know, what value is where, and then based on my understanding of the design and what's supposed to be happening, I can verify whether it is happening. And so I did a lot of that to kind of figure out what's going on and realizing, wait, this LED is on. It's not supposed to be on, right? That, 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 that's one approach. Um, but when you start writing larger programs, manually clocking through a 10 K program is a, it's a very tedious task. Right. And so what I don't have here are breakpoints. I, I could, there's a way I could implement it where I implement a register. And when that red with the program counter is equal to that register value, you stop the clock. I could do that. Right. But I didn't. And so, you know, one of the ways I was doing software debugging was the very classic, you know, adding print statements, you know, now that I had this L LCD display, I could just print values out to it and, and, you know, debug things that way. Um, of course that required my LCD software to be working correctly. You know, it, there's a certain amount I had to build up to, to be able to use, be able to do debugging that way. But ultimately for the bigger programs, that's how I do it. You know, good old print statements, um, which is not, you know, not the best way with modern tools to kind of debug stuff, but it's what I had here for hardware debugging. I actually have a story I'll be getting to. So I will, I will, I will get to that. All right. Okay. Software. The software for the 64-bit factorial, I'm not going to go over the details here. You can kind of see a little bit of what I had to do to the right here. But I had to implement all the basic stuff. First, I had to implement 64-bit uh, addition and subtraction. Not that I'm using addition loops, but in the process of doing 64-bit factorial, you do have to add and subtract, you know, uh, the whole factorial algorithm, uh, you know, n times n minus 1. Well, you have to do a subtraction right there in order to get n minus 1, right? So I had to implement those routines. Also implemented 64-bit multiplication and division. Uh, the multiplication is based on bit shifting. Uh, and if you guys want to get into the details of how that works, I'll point you to my YouTube video where I go into the details of that. But that's what the bit shifting hardware that I implemented was for, was so I can do multiplication quickly. Had to implement decimal conversion. You know, that that's a that's a whole, you know, you don't realize how complicated it is to convert a binary value into decimal for display until you had to write that software yourself. And the challenge is doing it quickly. Um, if you think about, you know, what, you know, what is happening when you're doing decimal conversion, you're taking a value and you're dividing it by 10 multiple times to see what you get each time and it, to find each single digit within the overall value, right? Uh, doing that quickly and efficiently is, you know, you can implement it brute force, like what I just described, or you could try to figure out how to do it much more quickly. Uh, I would tell you the answer to that involves a lot of bit shifting to do it quick, more quickly. If you want to review my code, I actually, you know, the GitHub link is in the slide here. You can, you can go review the code, how I did it. But uh, when you, when I show you the sample, the program running, when I get to the example, one of the things I want you to keep in mind, doing the 64 fact factorial, it's much faster than con converting the results into a decimal to display. It takes more operations to convert a 64-bit number into a, a decimal to display than it took for me to do the multiplications to get to that 64-bit value uh, factorial, which, you know, something to think about. Uh, it was kind of amazing to realize. Um, and then also the basic memory copy and string operations, you know, you, just stuff that you need to kind of move stuff around. 
Furthermore, when I implemented my factorial, as some of you have experienced in my interviews, the, the you know the the near the end of the interview, I'm asking you to implement a uh, a ca optimal caching in order to uh, you know not have to recalculate values that you already calculated. Well, my implementation has the optimal caching. I will say, um, I had to allocate memory. You know, when you allocate memory and and uh, in assembly, basically you're just saying this address here is your memory. You're not. You know, there's no new operation that you would call. Um, and, and it set that up as the, the cache for doing optimal caching. So I had to write all that. Yeah, hardware debugging, you know, and one of the things that, one, probably the most profound thing that I learned in this process is what a computer really is. Um, we all think about computers as digital, like they, they are uh, a digital entity. Reality is they're more a digital simulation on top of an analog system. Like all the stuff that I you saw on my breadboard, the logic chips, the, the wires, the resistors, the capacitors, they're analog entities. Like even a transistor is analog because it's just, it doesn't go from zero to one instantly. There's a transition phase and there's a certain level the input needs to be at in order to start that transition. And then it needs to go a little bit more to finish that, that transition. And so understanding how all those behaviors interact with each other in order to produce the digital simulation that we refer to as computers was important to designing the things right. And I learned that the hard way in, in, in many steps away. And, and probably the thing that exasperated it for me was the fact that I was building this on a breadboard. The breadboard that, that I built this on, it's a good, I want to say three, two and a half feet by two and a half feet in terms of size, right? And at that size, um, you have long wires. And when you have long wires, you have inductance. And inductance is the property that, you know, if uh, electricity, electrical current is going through a wire, it will set up in a magnetic field around it. And then if you stop that current, the magnetic field just doesn't disappear. It collapses. It starts changing, right? And when, what, what happens when you have a change in magnetic field? You produce electricity again. And so there, you know, there was various issues I had with that where there would be these ghost signals that were generated due to the fact that my long wires were had too much inductance in them. And then when the you know, when the you know the digital signal went from one to zero, or where one was it had a voltage and zero it doesn't have any voltage. When it had a voltage, there's of course a current. And when it went to zero, that current goes away, causing the inductance to generate a kind of an echo, if if you will. Other issues, the breadboard themselves were imperfect. That when you put the wire in the holes, that's not a perfect connection, which, and so it creates some level of resistance. And what ended up happening is on the ground reference, like the ground line, which is supposed to be the same value everywhere, ended up at opposite ends of my breadboard, ended up being different at different levels. There'd be a, a good, you know, half to one volt difference between those but things that are supposed to be supposed to be the same voltage to preference. And that difference in value would cause signals that had to go from one side to the other to have a different reference. And thus they would interpret those values that, you know, those signals differently as a result, which created a whole host of problems. And so I had to figure out how do I ensure that my ground reference is the same everywhere throughout this large uh, breadboard that I had. And, and that, that, that was a learning experience too. Um, I will show you. I will show you one thing that showed up in the oscilloscope, and this is actually a, a visual representation of the first problem I talked about: inductance, right? So, what you're looking at here, the pink line on the bottom is the clock, and the clock, as I explained earlier, it just goes on and off, on and off, and it sets the tempo for everything that's happening. And most operations within the computer, the way things are set up, is that the clock triggers an action on what is referred to as the rising edge. That is when it's going from zero to one. Right. And all the hardware, it detects that transition and then it does what it's supposed to do when that transition is occurring. Not necessarily when it's at one, but as it transitions from zero to one. Right. And it has to, the transition, you know, when the transition gets to a certain point, then the trigger occurs and it ends up happening. And so, what that means is that when the transition goes from one to zero, nothing should be happening because it's not, it's not the rising edge. It's called the falling edge or, or the trailing edge of the clock. However, if you look at this, the, the yellow line on top is at one of the control lines in, in my system. And you can see it's changing from a zero to a one state after the clock goes to zero. And you can 
you can visually see what's going on there. You know, the clock goes from one to zero, and then there's a little squiggly in the line there. That's noise of some sort. Uh, and but that's uh, that noise is of, of enough amplitude that this control line interpreted it as a rising edge, and thus it would change state. Right? Not what I want. Not what I wanted. And. That was kind of hard to debug. It, it literally took me a week to kind of figure out what was going on. Like the things weren't happening what the way I wanted it to happen. And, and it ended up until I put a oscilloscope on this, did I see what was going on? And you may ask, where did that noise come from? Well, that's the inductance that I talked about. As this clock went from one to zero, um, it, it you know the, the magnetic field that was surrounding the wire would collapse and create that the echo, so to speak, and it was strong enough to create a what the logic chip perceived as a as a rising edge, and thus it screwed things up. Now, how do you fix that? Um, if you go back to my picture of here, that line that was doing it, you, you probably just see it. There is this white line that goes from where my mouse is now all the way across, and then all the way up to here, right? That was the clock line. I put. I ended up putting my clock components here in the middle on the left. In retrospect, I would say that was a mistake. I should put the clock in the middle in order to minimize the, the length of the wires that the clock signal has to the traverse over to get to. But it is what it is. I already wired everything, so I had to figure out how to make that work. That very long wire there is what was creating that inductance. And, it, and interestingly, that that noise that I that you saw on the oscilloscope, it wasn't happening near the clock line. It was happening all the way at the end of the clock line where it was going in. Like if I if I probe various points of this clock line, you'd only see it near the end because that's just how it works. So what I ended up doing is, um, you know, I had to solve this. I ended up putting what is called a ferrite bead. And that what that does is that it uh, filters out high frequency noise in, in any line that uh, that goes through it. And a capacitor, because capacitor kind of does the same thing. And that, that suppressed this noise sufficiently that no other, it didn't get rid of it, but it suppressed it sufficiently that the components in question didn't perceive it as a, as a rising edge. But that's an example of hardware debugging. And, and that, that part for me was fun because that's where I was learning. Uh, the software debugging, you know, you know, it's what I've been doing for like decades now. And I, I know how to do that. But learning how, you know, debugging the hardware was where I really learned how things work and where I came to the conclusion that um, computers are just digital simulations on top of an analog system. So anyway, um, one more thing, one more thing. In order to use this computer, I needed an assembler. Like, and where, where did I get assembler? Where I didn't, what I didn't want to do is write machine code in the raw ones and zeros, right? The raw byte code values. Uh, you could do that back when I had the, the original SAP one and it was 16 bytes of RAM. You could do it then. You could just hand look up, you know, I want to do LDA. What's the value? Okay, put that in kind of thing. Uh, but when you're starting to write software that's crossing, you know, 1K, 2K in code, um, that's tedious. You don't want to do that. So you want an assembler. Uh, but the question is, where do I get an assembler for what is essentially a custom instruction set architecture? Um, that I did find one customizable assembler, but at the time that when I was looking at this, it, it lacked little Indian support and I knew I wanted to use little Indian. So I wrote my own assembler, right? Yet, a, yet another learning opportunity. Uh, and so I wrote one. It's on, it's on GitHub. If you guys want to check it out at uh, Bespoke ASM uh, under my GitHub repositories, uh, it supports arbitrary configurable ISAs. I've, I've configured it for a few other computers, like the original uh, Kenback One, which is a, a early home computer from the 19, early 1970s. I've uh, done it for a few other things too. But uh, basically, you create a configuration file that describes your instruction act architecture and then this assembler like will compile your assembly code based on that it supports many addressing modes many operand types it has directives you can create macros um you can generate a binary image which you put on a rom in order on your computer or you can do pretty print so that you can visually inspect what was actually generated i even oh i even created the ability to generate language extensions for Sublime and VS Code so that you can have syntax highlighting of your custom ISA. So, you know, I, th I thought that was cool. Um, so and, and in reality, this is where most of my time in the project went, was writing the assembler and, and, and doing it well. So 
Um, I did learn a few things, you know, you know, one thing I'll point out is an assembler is really just a fancy lookup table. Here's a monotic, go look up what the bike code for it. Now, in reality, it's not just a monotic. It's also mon monotic in combination with specific operands where there lies one of the complications of writing an assembler is how to recognize what kind of operands you have in order to modify how you're going to interpret that mon monotic in order to get the very specific bike code that you want. And so I had to, uh, I had to do that contextual, contextually uh, parse and understand what the operands are in order to kind of produce what it finally was intended. Uh, but it ended up working well, you know, so you can check out the code, how I did it. I won't pretend the code is, code is clean. I'm sure some of you would have critiques of my code, but still nonetheless, it got it working. Um, there's also the other, the other thing that I added was flexible address space management. Now, the assembler does not allocate memory. Right, the, the, you're working at assembly. It's not like C where you have a, a new operation in order to allocate a memory block. You have to just declare this. I'm going to use this memory for that and that memory for that, and you do it by addresses. But you know that can be cumbersome if you have a lot of different variables and a lot of different stuff. And so I created a way to, at compile time, just kind of say I want to place memory in this general area, and the, the and, and the assembler will take care of ordering things and assigning you know the address values to the various variables that you wanted, that type of thing. So um, that was a, another good neat add-on that I created. One of the things that I got better at with this project was regular expressions. I mean, every there's I'm using regular expressions to do the parsing, and uh, you really had I really had to get better at my regular expression programming in order to make that work. So you know that that's kind of core to everything here. So that that was the additional add-on. So we can get we get you know we can see it work. But before I do so, I'm going to just pause. Any questions on what I presented so far? Did you did you have an oscilloscope before you started this? Yeah, yeah, I did. I've been doing electronic projects for year like since the basically since I got married. Honestly, <laughs> you know, it was what I what would be my hobby to do is to kind of build various things. Nice. Yeah. So I had a oscilloscope, a few other things, but yeah, I had I I had all the equipment. I just just helped me learn up my game in terms of electronics. So uh, before I'll show you work, I'll show you my last slide. If you want to see more, you can go to my YouTube channel, which is uh, aptly named Michael Camprath. Um, so search my YouTube channel. I have a bunch of videos that goes over the various stages of design and more detail on a lot of this stuff. So if you had questions about, for example, the stack pointer, what it does, and how you design it, and how you use it. I have a video on that. So you, you can go check out in detail on those various things. So let's get to the demo. Let me uh, kind of switch things around, um, switch to this camera. And here is, this is a live view. You know, here's my hand kind of thing. Um, and I'm just going to turn it on. I have a ROM in here right now. You get to kind of guess from the ROM, the, the name on a ROM is N factorial. So this is the factorial program. Do you um, want to stop sharing campus so that the, uh, your other camera yes. pops up? Good job. Thank you. I, I forgot about that. Okay. So here it is. As I was saying, um, here is the, the ROM that contains the program. Uh, as you can see from the label I put on it, it's the N factorial program. I have a few other ROMs down here that I can swap out that have a few other programs, and we'll get to that. Uh, but all I need to do now is just turn this on. I'm going to apply the power, and you can see it start running. Um, oh, man, live demos always go bad. Oh, you know why? Someone jacked with my voltage setting. I was putting too many volts into this. There we go. Now it's working. And you can see it working. I can switch the view to closer to the uh, close up view of the actual display. If you want to check things, I'm going to pause this when it gets to 20. So you get someone can go to Wolfram Alpha and check to see if it calculated the right value. You can see it getting a little bit slower. Okay, there it is, 20 factorial. Someone want to go to Wolfram Alpha and, and double check that is the correct value, go feel free. Um, but there, yeah, it was, there's working. Now, the thing that you notice as it was getting closer to 20, it, it was getting slower. I will tell you, it, uh, the reason why it was getting slower it had nothing to do with calculating the factorial. It was converting the, the, the value to a, to a digital or a, a string representation that I can then print to this display. Um, the more digits I had to convert, the longer it took. 
And, and so here you have 19 digits, uh, which is the largest 64 bit factorial you can calculate. Uh, and it just took longer than uh, the factorials that required one digit to display. And so that's why I can restart the clock and we can see it start over again, right? Now, now the cache has been populated and so there's really no multiplication operations going on. Any slowness you perceive is 100% due to the uh, conversion of the values to a, a string for display. So there's that. I can zoom out. Let's zoom out here. You can see all the, all the blinking lights. Uh, the things to kind of watch. This is one of the uh, re registers right here. The, uh, this is the I register actually. And this is used to control multiplication loops and stuff like that. At least in my code, I've used it to control multiplication loops. This one, this is the J register. And this is controlling the conversion of a, of a hex value into a string for display. And so the value that you see it pauses at is actually ends up being the number of digits that needed to be displayed. If you, if you look closely, you can kind of see the number of digits on the display in the, 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 the binary value that you see here correlate because they're, they're the same. Um, I could slow this down though. Admittedly, uh, let's go ahead and slow down the clock. So I could slow down the clock based on the, using this resistor here. Uh, but this is actually not a good program to slow the clock down on because uh, I have this pause. But basically what it's doing is a counting right here, a 16-bit counting to kind of for display purposes to give you a slight pause so you can look at the, uh, the results rather than kind of blazing by real fast. Let me actually change the program. I have another program that can run here. Uh, the primes will calculate prime values. And it actually calculates 32-bit primes. I have let it run for a while. Uh, let me make sure I get this in the right holes. Yeah, that's it. I let it run for a while. It took about a week to get to two, the, the primes in the 2 million range. Uh, in case you're wondering, the clock here, the clock speed is about 480 kilohertz. And so at that speed, it took about a week to get to uh, 1 million prime, like the prime numbers you see at a million. So let me actually zoom in on the display so you can see it happening. So here it's calculating the primes, right? I, and just stating it again, you can go row and alpha if you want to verify that it's calculating it correctly. Um, if I zoom out, let's zoom out in this view here. Okay. If I zoom out and slow down the clock, you can kind of see things happening a little bit better. So the clock slowed down to, I think it's about at this speed, I think it's about 10K Hertz. Uh, and at this speed, you kind of can see data being moved around. Uh, you can see the multiplication happening. And when the multiplication is happening, you see values, this is the A register. You kind of see the shifting happening as values can look like it's going left and right. Um, just found that interesting. You see all the various instructions in the instruction register and what's going on there. The control lines, you know, which ones are active at any given time. I admit part of the part of the reason why I enjoyed this project is once I get to this point, just watching all the blinking lights, I almost consider it LED art. I do intend to frame it and put it like a, put it in a, in a display case and just maybe put on a program and just let it sit there and blink away and put it up on the wall. Nice. Well, uh, what's what's next then, Camp? If like after this gets uh, like framed and it's running, it's it's <laughs> program and as art in your home or maybe well, in the future in some museum. Like, what what's the next thing? There's a few more things I actually I do want to do to this. Actually, let me speed up the clock so you can see some more primes. Um, there's a few more things I do want to do to this. That's no, not fast enough yet. There you go. Now you can see you're scrolling again. Okay, so clearly one of the things that you don't see yet is some kind of input or output mechanism. Or there's an output. Obviously, I got that display down in the, in the lower left, but there's no input mechanism. Like I can't provide input some way. Uh, and so th that's one thing to add. A classic way to do that is to add a UART, uh, basically a serial connection, so that yeah, I can connect it to a computer be a, a serial line and use some kind of terminal to interact with it. So that would be one approach, or I could somehow figure out how to 
attach a keyboard directly to it and, and having it respond to the keyboard. Um, both of those, one of the problems I think I need to solve is how to do interrupts. Uh, I haven't put any thought to that yet. I may be able to get a way of not doing interrupts by just doing a constant polling uh, of uh, the input or value. But uh, I don't know, it's, it's a problem fi to figure out. Then there's a, a mass storage device. Like, can I add an SD card to store values or, or files or for whatever? Um, other things I could add, I could add music, like uh, get one of those retro 80s music chips and add it and have this thing drive that music chip and just play music with all the blinking lights. I think that would be kind of cool. Things to work on. But I will admit my original goal of being able to do a 64 fit, fit factorial has been accomplished. And I, everything I needed to learn to do that, I'm done. Um, so we'll see. We'll see what's next. Anything else that you feel like uh, you've learned that is going to improve your software capabilities now that you've learned more about the hardware? Well, I definitely had to up my game a little with Python um, in order to uh, write the assembler. So uh, especially around, like I said, the regex uh, programming and how to use regex effectively, uh, that, that, that definitely improves stuff. Uh, with respect to assembly, um, so this is not the first time I've programmed an assembly, I've programmed an assembly on the Z80 chip, if you know what that is. And then back in the day, you know, when I was a, what was I, 12 or 13, when I got the paper route in order to save up my money to get a TI-994A uh, for my first computer, you know, back then in the early 80s, you only had two choices for programming languages. One was basic and the other one was assembly. So it wasn't uncommon for you know, the teenagers who are hacking with computers to learn assembly because uh, that was your only choice, right? Um, so I actually, in the 80s, I was programming in assembly then too. Uh, so it wasn't a new experience for me, but what was new here was designing the actual instruction set architecture and thinking about, you know, what kind of instructions you want and want to enable, which ones are not useful. You know, to just that experience was educational in some ways thinking about that no oh, that that's it any other questions uh, what's the process you used for, for getting like the machine code into those chips these like a raspberry pi or something uh no i have a um you know, i'll put this in the view of here i have this thing called it's a program eprom programmer and so all you do is you put the eprom in here in it uh yeah, I got it right. You put the EEPROM in it, and then it's connected to my laptop. And then the binary image that my assembler creates just gets then burned into the EEPROM. You just send it to it. It's the way you used to do it back in the day, too. You program EEPROMs directly. Um, I, have one more, I have one more program to demonstrate here. If you ever, has anyone ever used a Commodore 64 or any of those early computers? No, man, am I the only one who's dating themselves here? Okay, well, there is this one program. It's a fairly, it's a fairly uh, well-known program, which is called 10Print. And what it did is in one line of code, it created a maze on the screen. Okay, and let me make sure I get the right holes. There we go. It created a maze on the screen, and it does that through... Basically, it, based on a random number selection, it, it basically you determine if you had a zero or a one. And if it's a zero, you'd print a, le a, a left slash. And if it was a one, you'd print a right slash. And more specifically, there's a special character on the Commodore 64, which was more than this a slash. It went from corner to corner, so, so to speak. And as a result, after it's printed for many lines, what you have is something that looks like a maze. And so that's what I implemented here. <laughs> And so if you look at it, it looks like kind of like a maze after at, at some point, right? So it, it, it's a, it's kind of a retro thing to do. So and hence the reason why I did it. Nice. I have to say that this does look like art, but maybe we should consider uh, next creating a laptop form of this to give to new employees, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or better yet better yet uh figure out how to use this in the interview process 
Oh, that would be very cool. You show up with a board and it's like, okay, implement this for me. <laughs> yeah. Here's the instruction set architecture. Make a maze or something like that. I'm sure we get a lot of people freaking out on that one. <laughs> Any other questions? Uh, this is a pretty basic question, I feel, but uh -huh. how do you decide what hardware to put where? <laughs> Does it oh, that was... That was actually the fun part because, uh, well, maybe not, maybe fun's too much of a word, but basically I had my electrical designs, right? And I showed you one earlier and that's what I did first with the electrical design of just figuring out what needs to be connected to what. And once I did that, I knew which chips I was using and I knew how they connected each other. What I do is I just put the breadboards, blank breadboards down and I place the chips and I just kind of imagine what needs to connect to what. And I, and I rearranged things until I got to a, a, a layout that just allowed me to minimize the amount of wires and it just kind of made sense. And in some ways, sometimes I had to figure out which orientation I wanted the chips on because certain pins needed to connect either to a chip below it or a chip above it. And so it was, it, it was, it was the art of the process. There was no science to it. I, it just trial and error until I found the one that worked. Engineering does become an art at a point. Yeah, it does. It, for sure it does. Any other questions? All right. Well, then I, I will. This is the end of my presentation. Um, do subscribe to my YouTube channel if you want to find out more about this computer. Michael Camprath. Easy, easy way. Easy search. I'm sure you guys know how to spell it. So um, cool. Thanks. You're also going to tell people to smash that uh, oh, yes. that the, the notifications button. Come yeah. on, Camprath. Smash that bell. Make sure you, uh, you <laughs> like the videos. Yeah. Hack the YouTube algorithm ethically. Yes. Yes. Cool. All right. Later, guys. Awesome. Thank you.